Hey, everybody. I hope you are doing okay. I hope you are staying safe. I hope you are checking in on your friends and your family, <clears throat> you're staying sane, you're staying up to date on all your work, all that good stuff. I know it's a hard time for everybody. Um, so please check in with me. Let me know how you're doing. Uh, feel free to send me a send me a message. Um, we can do a, a video chat, whatever. And there's a lot of different ways we can do that. So please, please stay in touch with me and um, let me know how I can help you uh, through everything and keep you going on on all your schoolwork as well. So uh, today we're going to do a video lecture and we're going to do a video lecture related to computers, specifically intro to computer specs for audio production. Um, a lot of this might be um, basic for some of you if you've if you've been around computers a fair bit or bought in a few computers or, or done some production stuff on your own uh, before you started school. But um, I think there'll be some things here useful to everybody and certainly some some nitty gritty details. And then as we move through all of these basics, um, and just in terms of components and whatnot, what we're working towards and what we're gonna to get to at the end is um, what specs are important based on what you're trying to do or what your specific activities are in music and audio production related to computers. I get a lot of students that come and ask me, it's like, hey, is this computer a good computer for to do music on? It's like, well, it, it depends on what you're doing musically with your computer. And so that's what we're working towards today. It's gonna to be a super long lecture. Uh, we're gonna get through some some important fundamentals and tech spec ideas and peripheral ideas, and then uh, get to answering just some, real quickly some basic questions in terms of what aspects of the computer are most important based on what you're doing. So that's what we're doing today. We'll start with this um, uh, basic digital lingo. Um, normally, had this semester not gone uh, haywire and, and us all be quarantined, we would have done a section already on um, counting binary, doing some basic um, understanding of binary and hex, uh, which is another um, way number system that computers use. And we'll still incorporate some of that. I'm just going to shift that around a little bit to later in the semester. Um, but basically, uh, basic binary digit is one or a zero. And that one is either turned on or turned off, and that moves through different places. And we get, we put eight binary digits together, we get um, a byte, eight bits is a byte, four bits is a nibble. I didn't make that up, that's for real. Um, and we see these numbers all the time. You see uh, 256, 5, 12, 10, 24. What are those based on? Those are all based, those are all uh, based on the placeholder number systems when we have a byte of uh, turning on the different ones and zeros. And so two to the 10 is what gives us 1024. Uh, two to the nine is what gives us 512. All of that will make more sense. I'm sorry, I'm doing a little bit of this out of order. We'll come back and, and see some of that. But um, just in terms of the lingo that we see, uh, eight bits is a byte, uh, 1,024 bytes is a kilobyte, 1,024 kilobytes is a megabyte, 1,024 megabytes is a gigabyte, uh, 1,000 gigabytes is a terabyte, 1,000 terabytes is a petabyte, 1,000 petabytes is an exabyte, um, and so on and so forth. That's structure. Nowadays, we, we talk about um, processors in gigabytes and RAM in gigabytes. We talk about hard drives in gigabytes and terabytes most of the time these days. Um, and uh, so that's what that terminology is and based on. Um, next up, what's super important to us in a lot of different ways in terms of audio production is the peripheral interconnect. And so uh, there's a lot of primary ones that have uh, that are important in audio production and that have been important. And so you still should know about those and what the limitations of those are. And so um, I'm just gonna try to go through these real quick and just so you have some sort of guiding reference of what they are and aren't capable of. Um, the important, the two real important places that we see peripheral interconnects are with um, interfaces, obviously. And so how your audio interface is connected is through probably one of these types of of peripheral interconnects and then hard drives. A lot of times nowadays we're using external hard drives. And so those have one of these types of connections associated with them. But there's other, these are used with all sorts of other things, not related to audio, obviously, um, and all sorts of different disciplines. So USB is the most ubiquitous. We see that all the time. Ubiqui uh, USB has been with us for a very long time. Um, we started with USB 1.0 uh, way back in the day could only transfer 12 megabits per second, um, which is not a whole lot. I think 
let's see, if we throw back to the 90s, the original uh, DigiDesign M-Box to use with Pro Tools was USB 1.0. Could basically just do two channels in and out, um, uh, two channels in, two channels out at a time. That was it. That was the limitations, the cap that you could put on USB 1.0. Um, since um, uh, I should have looked up dates to be more specific, but I'm you know since the um, later the mid 90s um, USB 2 became really prevalent, which moved us up to 480 megabits per second, um, which is pretty standard. And honestly, you still, you go to Sweetwater, you can find tons of interfaces that really, this probably still occupies the bulk of the consumer market interfaces. So there's a lot of, of interfaces that still exist and are still popular in the USB 2.0 range. Um, that cap, and, and just to jump down here real quick, we'll talk about FireWire in just a second, but this very, very similar to FireWire 400. FireWire was pretty specific, mostly to Apple products around the same time period and had the same limitations in terms of throughput, data throughput, how much, how fast they were and how much data could transfer at a time. And so if we go back to this idea of a USB 2.0 interface, most of the times the numbers we see associated with those interfaces are um, 18 in, 18 out at one time. Um, that has to do with the limit of the, again, the, the speed and data throughput of that connection protocol of and what you get at about 480 megabits per second. And so um, 18 in, 18 out, how that's usually implemented, how we see it oftentimes is it'll have like eight preamps uh, built in. Maybe you have, uh, you can do what's called an eight at light pipe input. We'll talk about more digital protocols in an upcoming class very, very soon, but an eight channel expander via eight at light pipe, and then another, usually two channels through SPDIF. And so if you do eight plus eight, you get 16 plus two is, is 18. And that's how oftentimes, you know, again, across the board, by and large, we see um, USB 2.0 interfaces, USB 2.0 interfaces have um, IO capabilities. Um, and so that's this. And then we were really stuck here until, you know, honestly, it's only been a handful of years, four or five years or so that we've started moving to the, and maybe not even that long, that's probably generous to the USB 3 and 3.1 and stuff like that, where we get to 10 gigabytes a second, which is obviously this massive, massive jump. And I'm going to come back and talk about that in just a second. Uh, it's just been the last year or two that we've seen USB 3.2, where we get to 20 gigabits per second, which is um, four music purposes, that is huge. That's really beyond what most of us could ever do or need to do with music production, uh, for music production needs. And 40 gigabits per second for USB 4, which is just now starting to come down the pipeline. Um, I talked about this just briefly. Firewire 400 um, came out, and I believe Firewire 400, if I remember right, came out before USB 2.0. And so that was um, a, a really big deal when Apple introduced that back in the day. And then USB 2.0 came out at 480 megabits per second. Apple followed that up a few years later with FireWire 800, which was 800 megabits per second. Um, this, this was, again, a standard that really lived in the audio production community for a number of years from those you know, um, 90s until recently. We're just starting to see the FireWire interfaces die off. You still can find a few new uh, FireWire interfaces at Lake Sweetwater or whatnot. Um, they're becoming less prominent because we don't see those uh, connections on computers like we used to because they're being phased out by newer, faster, better protocols. Um, but they, this was really significant for a very, very long time. Let's, before I keep moving on, let's, let's look at real quick here. So here's what FireWire 400 looks like. It's kind of like one, two, three, four, five-sided elongated rectangle with these angled corners. FireWire 800 is this right here, which is the square, a little bit larger in size and square. Um, Here's the different USBs, standard USB type A, USB 2.0 type B, through USB 3.0 type B has this um, extra little thing that juts up like this. And you can see uh, USB 3.0 was a five gigabytes per second, I believe. Then um, we have US, the USB 3.0 micro. We see this on uh, a number of hard drive connections uh, use this. The USB Mini 5 is um, 
I guess I've seen it mostly on cameras, video cameras, digital cameras, that type of connection. We see this a number of times. Um, 2.0 micro is, I believe, on some Android phones. Uh, type C is the connector that is used for, this is the USB type C connector. We're gonna see this for a number of different things, but that is what's used for uh, USB uh, 3.1, uh, 3.2 and 4 is all on this type C connector. This is becoming very universal. And so this is backwards compatible with all these other types of USB. Um, and so let's see, we talked about the Firewire 400 connectors. Let's talk about Thunderbolt. Um, so uh, let's see, maybe, uh, again, probably ballpark five years, um, not super important timeline uh, for purposes of class, but, um, Five or a few more years ago than that, Apple jumped ship from the FireWire and moved to Thunderbolt. And uh, it's this small, again, it's, it's one, two, three, four, five, six sided. It's kind of a square with these corners chopped off. So it was originally called a mini display port uh, connector. Before it was used for Thunderbolt, it was used for an, uh, a video display. Uh, connection, so you could add an additional display to your, display to your computer, um, and then was later adopted for Thunderbolt One and Thunderbolt Two. Um, I have an older iMac; it's actually a, still a really, really powerful iMac. It would have been purchased probably circa 2009. Um, that is has this connector, but it is not Thunderbolt. It is just for video expansion via this Mini Display Port to another uh, display screen. Um, again, when Apple came out with this Thunderbolt 1 from a timeline standpoint, um, it, it really kind of blew everything else out of the water. I believe we were just introducing, being introduced to USB 3.0, which would have been about five gigabits per second. Um, and so Apple did this, followed it up a, a couple years later with Thunderbolt 2, and then has just recently, again, within the last year or two, moved to Thunderbolt 3 on new Mac computers, and Thunderbolt 3 uses this Type-C connector that looks like this. This is the Type-C connector. You can see it here, here, and it's just this sort of really flattened, elongated, elliptical um, shape. We see it, let's see, I have a Google Pixel phone. Google Pixels have used this. Some other phones, I believe, do. Um, we see it on some, uh, some newer, higher um, quality audio interfaces. We see it on lots of hard drives these days. And so just to Point of clarification though, if you use anything that um, you see this connector on a hard drive or an audio interface or a computer is capable of USB 3.0 at, at the very minimum, okay? But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's capable of 3.2 or 4. Um, anything that's capable of 4 would be backwards compatible, but you see this, you know you're at least dealing with USB 3.1 and above. When you, when you see this on a Mac, it means that it's definitely Thunderbolt and it is definitely going to be Thunderbolt 3. Um, and that also means it would be compatible with USB uh, 3.1, okay? But it doesn't work the other way. A lot of PCs, again, incorporate this with USB 3.1 type protocol, but they do not incorporate the Thunderbolt protocol, meaning you don't get these same speeds and connectivity. Um, hopefully I, I did an okay job explaining that. It just means that the Apple Thunderbolt has used this type of connector for their protocol. And so um, if you want to take advantage of Thunderbolt 3, right, you need to make sure that your computer is Thunderbolt 3 compatible and your interface or your hard drive, or whatever you're using is also Thunderbolt 3 compatible. Um, it's got to work both ways for you to take advantage of the extreme speeds and throughput. Okay, let's keep moving on. On laptops for a number of years through the 90s and early 2000s, we had an eSATA um, connection. It is, uh, I forgot to put it, it's not, it's not like that, but I feel like it's similar in, in size and shape to that. Um, that was, was really pretty fast and was used not for audio interfaces, but for hard drives a lot of times, maybe for some, some cameras. Um, 
then this is PCI, PCIe. This is a PCIe card. This is the PCIe card that's used for Pro Tools HD interfaces. And um, this is the HD core card. And so just a few minutes to, to step back and talk about this. Um, this connection speed is PCIe is 6.4 gigabits per second. Now, based on the conversation we've just had in the last five minutes, 6.4 gigabits per second sounds like, ah, wow, that's nothing. Like, that's lame. Well, that's, that's nothing. But from a timeline standpoint, when this came out, PCIe came out, I believe, circa 2003, something like that, right? So, you know, that's a good bit ago now, 17 years ago. When this came out, like we were back still for the most part dealing with other consumer interfaces uh, in back here around USB 2.0 and probably would have been, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, yeah, FireWire 400, maybe FireWire 800 getting ready to come out. And so this was massively different. The speed and data throughput that you had with uh, 6.4 gigabits per second was not even in the same world or realm as what you could do with a, with a consumer type interface with these other protocols. And so this really has a lot to do with why Pro Tools became who they are in the industry, why they became the industry standard because of how many tracks you could have in and out at the same time, the stability associated with that, that's a bigger deal. The fact that, that they learned how to deal with latency and the IO counts that they had because of the cards that were PCIe based was really had to do with why Pro Tools solidified themselves in the industry. And so, yes, this was a huge deal uh, for a number of years, but um, as you can see, based on all of the, what we can get with the newer generations of USB and Thunderbolt, um, we've kind of left this in the dust a little bit. And which is, again, just to kind of expand on this idea of talking about Pro Tools HD for a little bit, um, here is a PCIe card. Here is the last version of the Mac Pro that they just recently uh, start, are starting to phase out with newer versions. And, and some people call it the coffee pot or the coffee mug or the potted plant or the trash can. It's, you know, it's about this big. We have them in Studio A and Studio B. You can't fit one of these things in there. There's no way to shove, you know, there's no PCI ports, which was a big deal when Apple announced this, the whole Pearl community was up in arms because um, most professionals in both the audio and video world need lots of peripherals that run off of PCIe cards because of their speed and stability for a number of years in the way that that dominated the industries. And so the industry was up in arms when they came out this because there's no PCIe slots. Um, but what we buy nowadays in order to do this, and you'll see these if you look behind the consoles and the studios is what's called an expansion chassis. They're magma expansion chassis oftentimes. Um, and they're basically a box that's designed to shove one of these PCIe cards in, and then it connects via Thunderbolt because this, the main connections on this are USB and Thunderbolt. And so as you can see, if I have, whether regardless of what Thunderbolt type I have, my speed and data throughput is, is much greater than what I need here. And so there's no bottleneck, there's no loss of quality or speed um, associated with using an expansion chassis and then connecting the expansion chassis via Thunderbolt to your coffee mug, okay? Um, that's enough on that for now. We'll talk a little bit more about Pro Tools in a second. Ethernet, Ethernet was, um, here's the connection speeds again, just so you can have a point of reference. For a number of years lived uh, primarily at one gigabit per second. Um, and then now we see an, a lot of 10 gigabit ethernet. And, um, but just, a point of clarification, we haven't seen for most of the audio production world until recently, any sort of standard audio interface or connections via ethernet. And the reason that is, is because um, real quickly, the packeting system, the way that the internet protocol works and the way that a lot of those things are written is that it's packets that move um, out into the um, network and maybe get reassembled as they get there and they, they're not linear. And so it's, it's been very hard to do uh, real-time audio in a system where the packets move in that fashion and get transferred in that fashion. And so you've probably heard us talk a lot about at school, we have Dante system, right? And the Dante system takes advantage uh, of an ethernet protocol. 
And that's because nowadays we do have a couple different, the, the two main ones probably are Dante and Audio Video Bridge, AVB. And they are audio networks that have really low latency that we can use for professional uses in audio and do real-time audio things. And because they operate uh, linearly um, in real time in um, a way that standard networks haven't in the past. So there's a little bit on that. Okay, let us keep moving forward. Probably spent more time there than I wanted to or needed to. But uh, just a second, just a second. And we're back, take two. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Let's see, we just started to talk about hard drives. And I think I was saying hard drives are vastly important to audio and music production and um, is, is a stumbling block for a lot of people, I think. And so uh, first off, let's talk about rotational speed. So if you have a traditional hard drive in your computer that has a rotational disk that looks like this, um, or you have an external drive that looks like this, one of the first and most important things to deal with with the hard drive is the rotational speed. Um, most hard drives you find these days are, are 5,400 RPM hard drives. Um, and that honestly is one of the biggest bottlenecks for audio music production. This is one of those things that is just absolutely, if you're doing very many audio tracks, recording actual audio in terms of vocals and drums and guitars and whatnot, the rotational speed um, of you having very many tracks is probably the most important thing that you need to think about. And honestly, a 5,400 RPM hard drive doesn't get you very far. Um, it, it causes bottlenecks and problems oftentimes. And the, the weird thing is we're, we're at a point, it's, a, it's an odd thing for me that uh, a number of things related to audio and computers and whatnot, if you go back 10 years, it was much easier if looking at tech specs and finding tech specs that would lay out all of these things that we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about here. And it's becoming increasingly, I don't know if it's like the dumbing down of society or what it is, I've always wondered this that it's becoming increasingly difficult to find some of these things. You have to really go digging. And even if you go to the manufacturer's website, sometimes it's a struggle to find this information nowadays where I think it was, I feel like it, at least it was more readily accessible 15 or 20 years ago as I date myself right now. But um, uh, rotational speed. So if you're going to buy a hard drive for your audio drive, for, um, for your OS to run off of, then... I would argue that 70, having making sure that that's a 7200 RPM drive at minimum is super important. Um, now, if you're just talking about a backup drive, like, hey, I made this session, um, I am going to back up this information. So in case I need to reload this session and use it, then that's fine. And that's the thing that I think gets us into trouble because a lot of times when people say just like, hey, I'm gonna go to Best Buy and I'm gonna buy a hard drive to use. If you just do that, most of the time, the general public is using hard drives just to store data. To, to archive data. And it doesn't, the hard drive speed doesn't need to be 7,200 RPMs. They, they, it doesn't matter to most people. And so, but for us trying to do real-time audio, particularly with a lot of audio tracks, having that 7,200 RPM is super important. It's one of those places I've just seen repeatedly there being this massive divide um, in terms of not being able to do a ton of tracks, but honestly being able to do loads and loads of tracks, um, you know, with the 7,200 RPM drive. Um, important specs, if you can find them. One is seat time, and that's the mechanical function of the arm, this little arm right here, and the time of move, move around to a new location. Um, again, if you're talking about a hard drive that you're using for your audio files, um, then if you can find one that's in that eight milliseconds, maybe 10 milliseconds, that's, you're, you should be okay most of the time with large audio track sessions with that. Another spec you might see is access time, and that's the time it takes to obtain the data. So that's the seek time and the rotational speed um, together. But I would say, generally speaking, if you're looking for an audio drive that's not a solid state drive, I'm gonna talk about just in a second here. Um, if you can find a low seek time in the range of eight to 10 milliseconds and a rotational speed of 72 RPM um, and a de decent um, connection, um, which is the peripheral connection, then you should be good to go. Um, solid state drive. So this is a solid state drive. Solid state drive is kind of like kind of like a, the USB or a thumb drive, right? It's a type of solid state drive. Um, and solid state drives are, are 
infinitely faster than even a 7200 RPM drive. Basically, information is accessed almost instantaneously in a solid state drive. If you've ever, um, okay, imagine this, go through this notion of, okay, you turn on your computer, it's like you turn it on, it's like, it takes forever to load, and then you see the prompt, and then you see the screen load, and then you see you want to load up Pro Tools or Logic, and and you click the button and it takes a second and it bounces and then it takes five minutes to load everything up. Um, by having a solid state drive, if you've lived through that, you probably have a slower drive. And there are a number of things that contribute to that, but to a, a drive can contribute to that. But um, having a solid state drive as your boot driver, when I say that, I mean the drive that your operating system is, is loaded onto and runs off of. And um, then turning on your computer can be, ah, and trying to load that session, um, is happens so much faster than having a rotational drive. And so um, generally speaking, I would argue if you have multiple drives that your solid state drive um, be ideally your internal and what your um, system, your OS, your operating system runs off of. That would make everything run much quicker uh, because of that. And so then lastly, again, the peripheral connection, if you're talking about an external drive, what type of these connections that we just talked about, um, are you gonna, is your con hard drive gonna be connected via? Because a lot of times we see, again, we see, still see this very, very commonly. Um, and this is okay, um, but as a person who's had USB 2.0 drives and for a number of years lived with a hard drive that was a 7200 RPM, Firewire 800 connection, I can tell you that there is a big jump in terms of what I was capable of doing with, with the USB 2.0 and Firewire 800. As a person, again, when I was regularly producing uh, songs and whatnot, uh, if I had a session that might have 100, 100 plus, 120 audio tracks running at the same time in a song, um, you know, I could do that without hiccups easily with a 7200 RPM hard drive that was connected via 800, Firewire 800. So again, this idea of about 800 megabits per second. If that was not connected via Firewire 800 uh, and it was only connected via USB 2.0, then the capabilities of that of running that session would get hiccups and it would, it would cause you all sorts of problems. So there's a big jump that happens in about that range. And then that means, honestly, if you're having a new drive that has a Thunderbolt connection, like we see a lot of times now, or a, a USB 3 point something connection, then that's great. You're not gonna have any problems with that being the bottleneck, but just because this gets a lot of people into trouble. This gets so many people into trouble. And that is that they see that they've got a USB-C type connector that's you know USB 3.1 or a Thunderbolt type connector. And so they buy the drive thinking it's gonna be great, but you know what? it's still a 5400 RPM hard drive. And so it's honestly doesn't do a good job of accessing data quickly like you need in an audio production setting. And so um, be careful of that. You gotta look at all of those specs uh, if you wanna keep yourself out of trouble. So uh, solid state drives, so best case scenario, you have an external solid state drive with connected via Thunderbolt, you know, and, and you're gonna be golden for your, if that's where your audio drives are. Your audio is saved. Um, okay, I think that's enough for hard drives right now. Um, oh, one more thing. Um, most of the time, if you're talking about a high level production facility or uh, if you have a, a, a quality workstation to keep yourself out of trouble, free from problems, most of the time we do, we have three drives, minimum three drives. One for your operating system that, that is your boot drive, your, that's your uh, OS and all of your software is loaded onto. And that honestly doesn't need to be that big. And I, again, like I said, ideally that nowadays that's solid state um, and keep that drive as clean as possible and as much other junk and clutter off of that drive as possible. And then we have one hard drive for your audio files that again, if you open up a Pro Tools session, a Logic session, where you save that should be your hard drive designated for your sessions or for your audio files folder. So if I save that session to my audio drive, then that's where my audio files are gonna be saved and that's where it's gonna be constantly pulling, saving those files to and pulling from. Um, and so as long as you have, again, a fast drive and a fast peripheral interconnect, um, you'll be kept out of trouble. And by having these things separate, your computer can run quicker and more efficiently. And then 
one drive for sample. So if you have, if you are into the kind of thing where you have really nice large piano sample libraries or string libraries or drum libraries or any of those things like we talked about the Vienna Symphony series, um, the contact and complete, all of that stuff. Generally speaking, again, you want a separate hard drive for those. Um, and if you're doing all of these things at once, again, the whole system can run more efficient and much quicker if you have a separate drive with a separate connection for each one of those things. Uh, last thing with hard drives is it, it's really a good idea and it's, it's really easy to buy cheap hard drives these days that are much bigger. Again, if you go out and you buy a four terabyte drive, double check, it's not just necessarily cool that it's a four terabyte drive and that it's a Thunderbolt or, or USB 3. Make sure that it's not Again, 5,400 RPM. But even if specifically if you have a four terabyte drive or a two terabyte drive or whatever, that you partition it to partitions not larger than one terabyte. Even a lot of times I would argue 500, 800 gigs is a good partition. And so that's something that you can do. Um, you go for Macs, you go to Mac Disk Utility and Partition. You can do a very similar type of thing in PCs where you format that drive and you create separate sections. So the computer actually sees it, the one drive. Say you have a two terabyte drive that you buy. You partition it and I might partition that into that two terabyte drive into three or four separate five to 800 partitions and then the, that computer actually sees those as separate drives. It's a way to keep the access time much quicker in most cases um, and keep those drives cleaner and, and running more efficiently to have smaller partitions. Um, if you're struggling with that, you wanna do that with a drive that you have, come see me and I can help you through that process. But again, on Macs, it's under disk utility, um, but you have, to, you have to format your drive in order to do that. So you need to be able to back up everything somewhere else. On that note, um, again, just don't be that person that you have invest your entire semester or even two or three years of uh, accumulating, working on projects, putting so much time and effort into and not having things backed up. Honestly, you should always have everything backed up in two or three separate places in addition to wherever your primary working drive is. I've, I've been guilty of this. I mean, I've um, lots of my school, I, I did get it recovered, but I mean, I had years and years worth of projects and um, quizzes and tests and things that I created for school and my primary school drive that I just like kept telling myself, you need to back this up, you need to back this up. And then uh, it wouldn't load for a time until I got some things taken care of and got it fixed. But um, so make sure you're backing things up. Public service announcement. Okay, um, just a real quick little message on optical drives. Um, we don't use these as much as we used to for a number of years. This was a very, very common way to um, to archive things. So you're working on a project, it's like, okay, I'm done with this project. I'm gonna give the client uh, these files or I'm just gonna put it in my library as an archive. And we did this with these types of disks for a number of years. That's not as common, but I still want you to have a frame of reference. CDs hold seven, a standard CD holds 700 megabytes of information. That's not a lot in nowadays in terms of like backing up a large audio file session. In terms of minutes, what is it? It's like 70 minutes, 80 minutes of music. The, a standard CD can hold and 700 megabytes of data. DVD holds 4.7 gigabytes. Again, so there was a number of years when I was working where, um, you know, if you did an, uh, an EP for somebody, then that, that was probably archived then when you're all said and done on, you know, it, it all depends, but what, four or five, maybe six, seven different DVDs that you would give them, Here, here's the archive of all of this so you can reload it or have somebody else load this up later. Um, dual layer DVDs were 8.5 gigabytes. Blu-rays hold 25 gigabytes of information. The way that they've done this and the way that this actually works, because all these discs are the same size, right? Is that the actual little pits and lands that are used to read the ones and O's, the binary information on these are, are actually smaller and smaller and smaller, which is why that um, you can put more and more information on these. And then there are such a thing as even like a dual layer uh, Blu-ray that can hold 50 gigabytes of information, which is actually pretty cool. It can be a, a nice way to archive things. And, and save things for backup if you have a Blu-ray burner or a uh, DVD burner. Now, let's talk about the primary components of a computer. The most important part, the most fundamental part, really across the board is the CPU or the central processing. That's the thing that does all the computations, it does all the math, it does drops into the slots of the CPU and does all the calculations of math to make all the sorts of things that we like happen. And so, 
It's what runs the program programs and the plugins and all of that stuff. Um, nowadays, so what the the specs that we see a lot of times are what like two point three gigahertz or or a three point two gigahertz processor. Um, most of the time nowadays we talk about multi core processors. Not always, but but oftentimes we see dual core a whole lot. We see quad core. The new Mac Pros have twelve core and sixteen core and maybe even twenty eight. I'm not I don't remember. It's been a while since I looked. Um, meaning that there are multiple processors happening uh, to do all the math for us. And so those are the CPUs. And it's, uh, again, very, very, very important part. Um, we'll see later how important, depending on what you're trying to do. Okay. Um, quick note, this is one of those things that, again, I want you to be historically uh, aware of. It's not as important as it was five years ago, but still want you to be aware of this idea between 32-bit and 64-bit processing. And when I talk about this, I'm not talking about, you know, in audio, we talk about 16-bit, 24-bit, and even now 32-bit files. That's not what I'm talking about, really. I'm talking about what the processor is and what the operating system uh, architecture is. And so for a number of years, we lived um, in this idea that the CPU and the OS and the software all ran on a 32-bit system. And now we're at a place where all of that stuff, for the most part, runs on a 64-bit system. Um, and everything needs to be that through the structure, the whole system needs to be that. I mean, the CPU needs to be a, a 64-bit CPU that can do 64-bit math, and then the OS needs to be written to optimize, optimize and to use that, and the software needs to be then written and optimized to use that, and the plugins are all written for encoded for being a 64-bit processor and to take advantage of that, and that whole system needs to be that way. This was a huge transition for the industry, for our industry, and in particular, Pro Tools. Um, Pro Tools transitioned, Pro Tools 10 allowed you to kind of live in both worlds you know, with a few things in terms of what plugins would work and what wouldn't. And then Pro Tools 11 was their first stance saying, hey, we're rewriting everything. Pro Tools 11 is 64-bit and 64-bit only. That's when we made this full transition from RTAS and uh, TDM plugins to AAX plugins. Um, and honestly, I mean, it's one of those things where, again, if you had a Pro Tools HD studio uh, 10 years ago before all of this happened, and you would maybe spent 50000 on your Pro Tools HD system, and maybe some people spent ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 on plugins, HD, the TDM plugins, um, and then all of that was rewritten to AAX, and a lot of people had to rebuy most of those plugins for this new format. This, this was a really big deal. If you want to hear some stories, come ask me sometime. This was a really big deal in our industry uh, for a number of years. Um, but a couple of things. One, 64-bit, being a 64-bit system allows us to, to use more RAM. 32-bit was limited to any one application only using four gigabytes of RAM, which was weird because you, you always had people talking about RAM is super important, RAM is super important. You need 16 gigabytes of RAM. And the reality is, is that systems couldn't, most systems couldn't really take advantage of that because they were 32-bit systems. And so um, it didn't make as much sense as probably some people were trying to say that it did in most circumstances. Um, but it allows us to process more information really quickly and allows us to process and utilize more than four gigabytes of RAM at one time. Um, and so all major DAWs right now operate on a 64-bit OS and 64-bit uh, architecture. Um, lastly, RAM. Again, RAM is another one of those things that you hear all the time that is super important for music and audio production. And yes, that's true, but again, it depends on what you're trying to do. RAM is random access memory, and that's where things are placed for temporary storage. Um, so, and most importantly, where sample, sample libraries are loaded onto. So again, just like we talked about, if you're the type of person that likes those really lush, uh, uh, highly sampled piano sounds and string sounds and drum sounds. I have, I have probably something ridiculous like 800 gigabytes of drum samples that I use, um, not all at once, obviously, but uh, some really, really highly intensive and meticulously sampled drums. Um, and so that's where RAM becomes super, super important. Uh, most of the time we talk about RAMs, and nowadays I think we typically use, I'm a little removed from the system, it's been a long time since I bought a computer, but we're at DDR3, DDR4 is now getting to be pretty common, I think, um, dual data rate RAM, and so, okay, that's a quick overview, again, some of that probably was, was review uh, for some of that for most of you, but 
Here's the real question and the reason that we have this conversation. Mark, I need to buy a computer. What should I buy? Well, what kind of system do I need? What do you want to do? What are you trying to do? What is your thing in the audio world? And so that's what we're going to tackle here really quickly. So say you're the type of person that does lots of audio tracks and, and you're the type of person that records mostly like real bands. And so you have a real drummer and you have 16 or 24 mics on the drums and you have a couple good, several guitars and several layers of vocals and um, keys and whatnot. And you're dealing with um, large sessions, really, really large sessions, 100 uh, tracks or more, you know, it's not weird. And again, in pop music or big pop rock and things like that to see that many tracks. Um, then um, having a really good hard drive, fast hard drive with good throughput, fast seat times, uh, Thunderbolt or USB 3.0 or a higher connection, probably solid state. But again, as long as it's a good quality 7200 RPM hard drive with um, a quick seek time, then, then you'll probably be okay. And honestly, RAM isn't super important and having a super fast CPU is not as important if, as, as long as you're the type of person, hey, I'm only gonna put a few plugins on each track, um, but uh, I do a lots of audio tracks. Then, then I tend to argue that one of the more important things is making sure you've got really good fast hard drives with fast connections, okay? Um, so what if you're the type of person like me, in addition to what I just talked about, that you happen to put 15 plugins on every track? Um, and so if you do lots and lots of effects plugins, tons of EQs and tons of separate compressors and tons of modulations and effects and uh, 10 million reverbs in your session and all sorts of stuff like that, you have lots of different plugins, then having more cores is more important than having a single super fast CPU. So I would argue, again, without, it's hard to know specifics comparatively, but generally speaking, having a dual core, quad core um, 2.3, for example, would be better than having a single core or dual core 2.7 or something like that, because having lots of effects plugins and having multiple cores that can be split out, split out and spread out between the different cores um, to multitask that work in a way that a single processor doesn't do as well. So having the multiple cores can break out the all the processing of all of those separate plugins and do it more efficiently and quicker for you. So what if you're a scoring person or something like that and you do lots of large sample-based virtual instruments like we just talked about, the big like um, big piano libraries and string libraries and um, virtual instruments like that that are sample-based, then one of the more important parts is that you have lots of really, really fast RAM because again, RAM is where things are placed temporarily. Your, your samples get saved on a hard drive and then in order to actually use those samples, they needed to be pulled up into RAM so that they can be quickly accessed because um, the connection RAM is, is very, very quick. It's, it's almost like uh, a very, very fast solid state drive that's there for temporary purposes, but it's very, very fast. And so if you're doing large sample library things, samples need to be triggered instantaneously. And so all those samples that sometimes can be, what sometimes a piano sample can be two gigabytes, really nice piano samples. Um, to be a playable piano sample. Or um, if I load up a really nice full drum kit uh, of drum samples that I can play on my electronic kit, again, a lot of times those can be almost two gigabytes as well for some of the bigger ones. Um, and so having lots of fast RAM is super important. And then secondary to that, I would say is having a single smaller, faster uh, speed uh, CPU as opposed to having more cores. So just the opposite of what we just talked about in terms of having lots of different effects plugins where you have, uh, maybe in this case, I have lots of large sample libraries. I would opt for a um, dual 2.7 core uh, as opposed to a 2.3 quad core or something like that. Uh, again, those are just generalities, okay? Lastly, what if you do, if you want everything that I just talked about, a hundred tracks and you do 
50 tracks of sample libraries and you do um, lots of virtual synths and samples and lots of tracks and all of everything at the same time. What if I do everything? Well, then you buy the new Mac Pro that has the top of the line everything and it's like what? I think if, I think I heard right. I think I saw an article that said if you spec it out max fully loaded as possible and you max everything out in terms of the fastest CPU, the fastest RAM, and everything else that you can buy for it and totally deck it out, it, it can run as much as like 50 grand or something stupid like that. But again, that's not the case. Most of us don't need that. The thing is computers are honestly getting to a place where they can do so much more than what we need for audio production. Computers, particularly these crazy, crazy computers that are coming out now, the supercomputers, are really um, more designed, I would argue, for um, video people, for animation people, um, people that do animation and gaming and stuff like that. And um, we don't need that as much for for music and audio production. I have this laptop that I use is a dual 2.7 and I, I can run, I can easily again run, um, if I have a solid state drive, Thunderbolt solid state drive hooked up to it, I can easily run 120 track sessions and um, lots of plugins and samples and everything like that. And it does an amazing job, which is just crazy for a, a laptop. It's that's, that's where we are. I still, again, I talked about my 2008 or 2009 iMac. And that was at the time it was the, it was the top of the line iMac. I think it's, if I remember right, it's a dual core or maybe a quad core 2.7. Um, and it, I can run huge sessions off of that and did for years. It's, it's really amazing. Again, with that Firewire 800, 7200 RPM hard drive, you can do tons and tons of things with that. Um, that the one thing I would say is again, particularly if we're talking about the Mac community is Another one of those things where there's a, a huge differentiation, one of those things that I would argue most of the time to spend the money on is if, if you can swing it, is there's a pretty big divide that happens between the i3 and the i5 processors and the i7 processors. Um, and uh, the, the iMacs that we have at school are i5s. They get a little bit bogged down quicker than I think that, that they should. Um, so even if you can get a slower i7 processor, um, that's the family of, of Intel processors that is used. I think I'm pretty sure it's still Intel. I might be wrong there. Um, then I argue try to find an i7 processor, particularly if you know you're going to be doing larger sessions. Some people never get into larger sessions. My sessions are only 20, 20, 30 um, tracks at a time. And so it's not as important, but particularly if you start to push those numbers regularly, if you start to have lots of plugins and lots of samples, then, then do yourself a favor and get something that has an i7 processor. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Of course, at any time, if you're gonna buy a computer and you do want some more input and feedback, uh, come find me, let me know, tell me what you're thinking and, and I'll try to help you out. So um, stay safe, everybody, stay connected, check in on the people you love and um, I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.